Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Chinatown Symposium. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Linda Zhang. My pronouns are she, her. I'm an Asian woman with black hair. I'm wearing a black shirt and I'm sitting in front of a pink virtual background, which features a black and white image of a 3D scanned point cloud model of Chinatown East. I'm an architect, drone pilot, and assistant professor at Ryerson School of Interior Design at FCAD. Um, and I'm excited to uh, be part of one of the co-moderators for this symposium today. I would like to begin by inviting you to join me in reflecting on the lands from which we join this virtual event today, uh, as well as the lands of your respective Chinatowns, and to acknowledge and learn about the agreements of those lands, the nations that cared for and lived on those lands for thousands of years and continue to share and care for those lands today. Uh, so I joined this meeting today from the land called Toronto, which is the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat, and continues to be home to many Indigenous peoples. Together, we all exist under the Dish with One Spoon Treaty, and as we learn from Indigenous uh, teachings, it is our responsibility together to protect this land. I express my gratitude to the original caretakers of this land, and I'm thankful to be working on this shared land. I also acknowledge that this land is covered by the Toronto Purchase of, 19, of 1805, known as Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaties, signed with, the, with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. I recognize that the land we are on was created through organized dispossession and colonial violence, including Treaty 13, which has been contested and disputed for over 200 years. In Toronto, Chinatown West is located along Spadina Avenue. It has its roots in the Ojibwe word Ishpadina, which means hill or sudden rise in land. In the mid 18th century, the Anishinaabe peoples camped along what is now the northern end of Spadina Avenue. This sudden rise in land provided a strategic vantage point to monitor trade activity with the French. While Chinatown may West uh, may be the most well-known Chinatown in Toronto today, there have actually been several Chinatowns on different lands in both downtown Toronto and the greater Toronto area. Some still exist today and others have already been displaced. With this history as our shared context, we recognize that anti-displacement work in Chinatown today must also acknowledge the indigenous histories of its land and work together with indigenous people to end ongoing violence, dispossession and displacement. So next, I would like to pass things over to Nadine Velassen Feldman, who is the Director of Programming at Museum of Toronto. Welcome, Nadine. Thank you, Linda. Um, I'll just start by providing you with a description of myself and my surroundings. I'm sitting on a green couch surrounded by some decorative cushions. I'm a Filipino woman with dark black hair that is pulled back. And tonight, I'm wearing a red V-neck floral top. Uh, as Linda said, my name is Nadine Villasine Feldman. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the director of programming at Museum of Toronto. And I'd like, you, I'd like to welcome you to Museum's sixth annual Intersections Festival and today's program, Chinatown, Future Heritages of Toronto's Chinatowns. Uh, the Intersections Festival is our annual citywide arts and culture festival that explores Toronto through diverse intersectional perspectives. And every year we have the privilege of partnering with individuals, artists, community groups, service organizations, heritage associations, museums, and more to present a wide variety of programs. This year's festival takes place April to June and adopts a new hybrid model balancing outdoor physical exhibits with virtual exhibits, events, and experiences. Uh, before we begin, I would just like to give a huge thank you to our Chinatown project partners. Um, Linda Zhang, who is the lead project partner um, and has worked so tirelessly tirelessly and passionately to pivot this project from a live exhibition and uh, IRL programs to uh, the Chinatown digital exhibit, which you can find on Museum's website, uh, as well as digital programs such as this one this evening. Um, we're, we're just so grateful for um, your patience, your perseverance uh, throughout this past year of, of, of having to navigate and negotiate what it means to bring this project to the public uh, in, in the time of this pandemic. Um, we'd like to thank Ryerson University who's played such a tremendous role in supporting and actualizing this project. Um, thank you as well to our presenters this evening, Chi Tam, Shelley Zhang, who are here on behalf of 
Friends of Chinatown, uh, as well as Howard Tam, Biko Mandela Gray, and Erica Allen Kim. Uh, a very special thank you to our venue partners, Cecil Community Center, where we had host to ho uh, where we had hoped to host the symposium, as well as the Chinatown physical exhibit. Um, and who have uh, continued to, to support this project uh, throughout this past year. Um, I'd also like to take the time to thank our festival funders, Canadian Heritage, Ontario Cultural Attractions Fund, uh, our community donors, Quad Real Property Group Toronto, the McLean Foundation, Downtown Young BIA, uh, as well as Linda Chu and John Donald. I'd finally like to thank our very hardworking staff at Myzeum for always doing so much and giving so much to the work that we do, but particularly for adapting and managing through this, this challenging last year. Um, so just some last information about tonight's program. This event is two hours long and includes a series of 10 minute presentations, as well as a roundtable discussion between educators, architects, designers, and grassroots organizers, exploring what defines the Chinatowns we know today, the current realities of Toronto Chinatowns, and how we can preserve cultural heritage for future generations. Um, the program will finish with an uh, audience question and answer period. Um, so please do feel free to be, um, uh, putting in your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen throughout the program. Um, and finally, please feel free to take breaks as you need them. Um, a full recording of the event will be available on our Myzeum website a few weeks following this event. So thank you again for joining us tonight and I will pass things back to Linda to begin the program. Thank you so much, Nadine. Uh, next, I would like to introduce um, our co-moderator for this evening, Biko Mandela Gray. Uh, Dr. Gray is an assistant professor of religion at Syracuse University. His research areas include continental philosophy, history of American African American religions, and affect theory. He's currently on a working on a book that explores the connection between race, matter, embodiment, religion, and subjectivity through the lens of the Black Lives Matter movement. Together, we've been collaborating on research around practices of heritage, memory, as well as commemoration ever since we first met in 2017. Uh, this collaborative work has spanned across both of our own communities and disciplines. And today we are here to talk about Chinatown. Um, I'm grateful to co-moderate this space today with Biko as we continue cross-community dialogue. Welcome, Biko. Good afternoon, everyone, or I guess good evening. Uh, my name is Biko Mandela Gray. I am uh, a black man, dark skinned brown uh, black man. I don't really know how to describe the color. Think chocolate here, uh, milk chocolate, uh, with long locks and a black button up shirt on. Uh, I, I tend to be minimalist, so I don't have anything in my background, but just my wall. Uh, I just want to follow up on Nadine's housekeeping rules. First, I want to thank Myzeum and everyone, and particularly Linda, for inviting me to be a part of this and to be part of this wonderful conversation. And then just a brief, uh, if it's time, we'll do a brief few housekeeping rules just to get us going. Nadine addressed them very, very, very early. But just to uh, begin, the, the panelists are going to do 10 minute, about 10 minute presentations. After that, we're going to have, we're inviting everyone to stay for a deep dive where we'll have a conversation um, with the panelists, both amongst themselves and, and I'll be there sort of moderating that. If you have questions at that point, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, after that, we'll also have a direct audience Q&A after that for a bit. Um, and then we just want to let you all know just in advance that this webinar will be recorded and posted, just as Nadine said. So we just want you all to know if you have to take breaks, if you can't stay for the whole thing, this will be recorded and posted in a few weeks. I think with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on back to you, Linda. Um, and I just want to say I'm happy to be here. Thanks so much, Pico. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being here during these virtual times um, and sharing in this space with us. Um, so I'm going to start with a short introduction, uh, which will be followed by presentations from Focht, Erica Allen Kim and Howard Tan, and then we'll end again with this round table uh, led by Biko. Uh, this symposium is actually one component of a larger Intersections Festival project, which includes a digital exhibit featuring nine projects exploring the possible future heritage of heritages of Toronto's Chinatowns. Um, so be sure to check out the Myzeum webpage for more information, and you can also find a link in the chat. 
Uh, this symposium was actually supposed to take place in person in 2020 at Cecil Community Center um, and was, um, as you all have guessed, postponed uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and in place of it, last year in April 2020, we facilitated a virtual speculative fiction writing workshop to reimagine a more expensive future for Chinatown in 2050. So you can see a screenshot of uh, what that workshop looked like on the screen right now. The speculative fiction writings were focused around questions of change um, at a time when the future for what was in store for Chinatown seemed to be so narrow, or at least how it was being, being portrayed in media. Um, the, the workshop really hoped to sort of expand how we might think about this by thinking about different forms of change. Um, who seeks change? Are there other world, others in the world seeking different kinds of change? And so out of this uh, workshop, I'm excited to announce that we have just released a book. This book contains 11 of the stories that emerged out of this uh, workshop. And there will also be a book launch on June 19th that we invite you to join. Um, you can learn more and register as well on the Myzeum of Toronto webpage. Um, and then on the screen here now, um, you'll also see that as part of the digital exhibit, um, each story is accompanied by a virtual reality companion. So you can also explore their architectural spaces um, of these imagined futures. Um, and so to some degree, a way of visualizing what a potential future heritage might be. All right, so we will get started. So today, today we're coming together again, just about one year after um, when the original post symposium was supposed to take place after this workshop took place um, in its place to discuss again the future of Toronto's Chinatown, um, as well as thinking about what the role and maybe potentially uh, agency of heritage could be within all of this. Um, each of our presenters will be sharing their own research, uh, work, and also organizing around the future of Chinatown, um, as well as reflecting on the, the over one year of impact um, from the COVID-19 pandemic. I just want to take a moment and step back first uh, and zoom out a little bit to look at the word heritage uh, and, and what does this word mean and where does it come from? Uh, so it actually uh, uh, sort of originates uh, from the 13th century old French term uh, for that which may be inherited and then evolves around the 1620s to mean the condition um, or state transmitted from ancestors. So as time goes on in, in Europe, the notion of heritage in the West begins to become deeply enmeshed um, and also reinforced by the establishment of modern nation states in the 19th and 20th centuries. Heritage becomes operative in creating continu continuity across generations um, and potentially creates a sense of belonging uh, or a sense of place. But we, as we all know, progress does not come without a cost and there's always a backside um, to such gains. So in the built environment, the protection of heritage is urgently brought to the fore in the early 1950s and late 1940s um, in the face of the total um, near total destruction of European cities during the Second World War. Simultaneously, um, in America, er, modern urban renewal projects were being brought into fruition. And so both these things are operating on the built environment at unprecedented uh, scales and speeds for the first time. So unsurprisingly, in response to this, uh, there is an emerging collective longing to restore the historic urban fabric that's lost and return it to some sort of previous wholesome unity um, to restore essentially a connection, um, a, continuity a continuity of history really in the name of heritage so that it can be inherited again for future generations. And so this is the emotional climate around which heritage practices begin to get codified through charters and councils uh, in, in the West. Um, so the Athens Charter uh, for the Historic Restoration of Historic Monuments of 1931, the Athens Charter of 1933, um, as well as the Venice Charter established in 1964, the International Council on Monuments and Sites founded in 1965 and finally culminating in the UNESCO World Heritage in 1972. So on the screen right now, we see here in Dresden, it's a photo now um, of 2016 versus the previous photo um, following this, the Second World War. So here Dresden has been completely rebuilt. Heritage has been restored. Um, some might celebrate this rebuilding as a rebuilding of peace, love, and hope. 
Others may see this as an erasure or an act of amnesia, which fails to recognize the events of the Second World War. So as we begin to understand heritage practices, we start to realize that even things like UNESCO, it's an imperfect science that's always evolving. Um, it's needing constant new discovery, better understanding, revision, it's dynamic and it's evolving. Um, and we should question, we should question heritage. We should question these charters, these practices um, that exist today. Um, and so here we can see that since 2001, uh, UNESCO has developed a new framework uh, to address intangible cultural heritage. And this includes things like oral histories, performing arts, social practices, rituals, festive events, knowledges and practices concerning nature um, and the universe, as well as traditional craftsmanship. But on this map that we can see on screen here, we can see that UNESCO's uh, 512 sites worthy of uh, intangible cultural heritage safeguarding does not include Canada, which we see in the gray in the top left corner. Um, and so what about Chinatown's intangible heritage? Uh, so if heritage comes from inheritance, what are these Python gate structures? How did Chinatown come to inherit them? What is the continuity? How is this continuity of this meaningful to this community? Um, and so to answer this, I wanna actually travel back in time together for a moment to 1893. This is one of the very first instances of architecture built by the Chinese community in North America. It is the China's Chinese Village and Theater Pavilion at the 1893 Columbians, uh, World's Columbia Exposition in Chicago. And at these World Expos, it's, it's important to note that uh, these pavilions are typically funded and constructed by the country of origin. But interestingly, this one was not. So just one year before the expo, um, as you might all already know, in 1892, this was the year that the US extended the Chinese Exclusion Act. And so the Qing government actually withdrew their support from the Chicago Exposition, and funding was instead raised by a group of Chinese Americans. And this was done as a political decision, as a way to clear space for community. And so if we zoom out for a moment and look at the overall design of the expo, we can start to understand why they felt this was necessary. So the Chicago Expo is actually nicknamed the White City. Um, and uh, it's that's for its master plan. So we can see there's an image in the bottom right that's showing an overview. And so in this master plan, all of the buildings are uniform height, style, and color, namely white. And the architectural design was being used both in a literal and figurative way to promote a certain kind of model for social cohesion and unity uh, in the US at that time. However, Chinese Americans did not fit this model, nor did Chinatowns. And nor, in fact, did the Chinese Village Theater Pavilion. So on this image on the right side, you can see this sort of linear uh, road-like attachment. This is known as the Midway. And this is where everyone who did not fit into the white city was placed. Um, and in fact, it was arranged uh, literally from black to white with uh, two uh, German and Irish villages located nearest to the white city, um, hard to believe uh, currently that German and Irish were, could not make it into the white city at that time. And then further away from the villages representing the Middle East, West Asia and East Asia. And so the red dot on the screen here shows the location of the Chinese village and theater. And so the intention of the pavilion was to correct the prejudices from European Americans um, that they had against Chinese and to gain broader acceptance with min mainstream society. So I reading from the quote on the screen, Send us the addresses as soon as possible so that we could notify members of the Chinese Equal Rights Club. You will then have an opportunity to elect your own national leaders to fight for your own rights. The great fair alone is worth many times your fair and half of your one year's earning to see. Half of one year's earnings to fight for your rights. And so the whole point of this pavilion and its architecture was highly political and highly strategic. And th so through these loose imitations of ancient Chinese architecture, this pavilion has been designed to make Chinese forms more palatable and easily digestible to white American audiences um, as a way to hold space, to clear space as a political decision. 
And we see the same sentiment playing out in Chinatowns across Canada and the US. So 13 years later in 1906, San Francisco's earthquake devastated one of North America's earliest Chinatowns. The city didn't offer to help rebuild. Instead, they wanted to replace Chinatown with Daniel Burnham's 1905 plan for San Francisco known as the City Beautiful Movement. This is the same architect as the architect of the White City. And the City Beautiful Movement is sort of where the White City led to um, in his own research, planning, and design. Um, so in response, San Francisco, through a lot of other forms of um, strategic uh, organizing beyond just architectural, but on the architecture front, ended up hiring a team of white architects led by Bernard Maybeck to design a town of town that all European Americans could love. Um, in Toronto, almost a century later, uh, old Chinatown was expropriated in 1947 by city council to make way for Toronto's new city hall. Um, this is rather late uh, compared to the timelines of other Chinatowns for um, this community to be expropriated um, and displaced at this scale. We can see that in the uh, right hand corner on the bottom, uh, we can see the massing of what was removed for to make way for the city hall. And so even though the community fought against this and were always strategic, you know, in many ways, um, and we're still facing this today, Chinatown continues to be deemed not worthy of safeguarding, not worthy of um, cultural heritage st status in, in many ways and in, in many charters that exist. Um, you know, here's a list of some important old Chinatown organizations of businesses, you know, they were all not deemed worthy of safeguarding by city council or by heritage practices at that time. Um, however, progress is always uh, made steadily and slowly forged forward by the community, um, even here in Toronto. So Chinatowns did eventually get its strategically orientalizing gates, a red dragon gate for Chinatown West and a Zhonghua Min archway for Chinatown East, which was a 10-year joint project supported by both the city of Toronto and the Chinese government. And in Chinatown West, passed on January 21st, 1980, uh, 80, a zoning bylaw number 9980 amended the official plan for the city of Toronto and designated a small portion of Chinatown West as an area of special identity, which encouraged the, encouraged the provisions of decorative elements to complement the emerging Chinese motif. And that is um, in their document described as uh, illuminated signs, street furniture, and architectural detail. How we think or what we make of that is also up for discussion, um, but we will put that on hold for now and take actually a look at this 2017 City of Toronto public art and donation policy. Interestingly here, um, it ex ex expressly excludes commemorative donations um, from um, ethnocultural donations uh, by requiring that a work must feature a significant contribution from Canadians or be an event that occurred in Canada. Um, and so we can see in this uh, 1981 Globe and Mail article um, around the contested proposal for a Sun Yat-sen statue in Chinatown, Larry Dodd writes, this statue is not a matter to be resolved by popular vote within the Chinese community, nor should it be decided by members of that community alone. To those who recognize the principle of Canadian sovereignty, it is rather obvious that the city council has no choice but to say no. So in other words, there is a mainstream belief that the community should not be given a say, either democratically or through its leaders and representative over its own neighborhood. This is an attitude which continues. Um, and Chinatown has been multiply excluded from, you know, both what is considered Canadian heritage, um, as well as, uh, you know, what's considered worth safeguarding by city council quite often. Um, but then, you know, even Canada was completely excluded from what UNESCO considers um, intangible cultural heritage sites. So, you know, where does this leave us? Uh, there is always a threat of displacement and expropriation that seems to define the existence of, of Chinatown. Um, Chinatown actually seems to be born out of this existence. And so how might a more critical engagement with heritage and heritage building practices help guide the future of Chinatown? Um, I personally believe that Chinatown um, has not only just been excluded uh, from mainstream heritage practices, but I think a more apt or uh, description is actually, I believe that the richness of Chinatown actually exceeds any present day definitions of heritage. Chinatown radically resists fitting in, fitting into any of these neat, neat categories of social cohesion, fitting into the white city, fitting into so-called Canadian sovereignty, 
fitting into wholesome narratives of architectural unity. And in, by doing so, Chinatown actually challenges all of us to think very differently about our city, its constituents, and also to make and hold space more expansively for community. And so what you're seeing on screen now is one of the this project's digital exhibits. It's called the Build Your Own Chinatown Heritage Board Game. Um, and here you get to decide what is worth safeguarding by selecting from 3D scan buildings from Chinatown East. So 3D scans are typically used in architectural heritage preservation to document heritage buildings um, and are used in reconstruction and preservation of them. However, Chinatown uh, is usually not something that's even deemed worthy of 3D scanning. Uh, we think otherwise, so we 3D scanned it. Um, and most importantly, this game is a two-player game. Um, this is because no doubt we all give value differently and in diverse ways. And we need heritage practices that are able to accommodate that complexity, which currently exceeds the way we think about heritage. And so with this game, we hope to spur conversation and allow us to stick a little bit longer in that impasse and in that richness of all that is Chinatown. Um, so I invite you all in the audience to play and contribute your visions to the future heritage of Chinatown by visiting the Myzeum website, our digital exhibit, or at Chinatowngame.com. Um, and so on that note, I would like to conclude this introduction um, and actually turn things over to our amazing presenters today. It is such an incredible honor to introduce our first presenters, um, which is Friends of Chinatown Toronto. So FACT is a grassroots organization comprised of artists, architects, writers, journalists, business owners, residents, and community activists fighting for community controlled, affordable housing, economic justice, and racial justice in Toronto's downtown Chinatown. Their advocacy centers the needs and voices of working class, senior immigrant communities who rely on Toronto's downtown Chinatown for cultural and economic resources that are unique to the neighborhood. Their mission is to build community power and resist displacement through political education, intergenerational collaboration, coalition building, and community-based arts. They aim to represent, build, preserve, and honor the memory and future of Chinatown and its community members as an integral piece of Toronto's legacy. Welcome Shelly Zhang and Chi Yi Tan. Okay, cool. Thanks so much to Maizia and Linda for having us here today. Always hard to go first, so thanks for everybody in the audience's patience with that. Um, so to start, my name is Shelly, my pronouns are she and her. I'm an East Asian woman with red hair in a side ponytail. Um, I am wearing a black t-shirt and I am sitting in what looks like an anime background. That's a beautiful green, green sky to hide my messy apartment in the background. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so as Linda mentioned, we are Friends of Chinatown Toronto or often known as FOCT for short. We're a grassroots group of artists, architects, writers, journalists, business owners, residents, and community activists. And FOCT is about a year and a half old right now. We are all volunteer and our structure is led by a nuclear steering team of about 20 people with a larger general volunteer group of about 90 people with members in various committees and projects. And I see lots of wonderful familiar names in the, in the group here. So thanks to everyone for coming out. Um, next slide, please. So just to give a bit of background about how we started about a year and a, about almost two years ago now, um, the catalyst for FOCT occurred in the summer of 2019 with the loss of the Bright Pearl building that you see depicted here. And so this building was once a fixture of Toronto's Chinatown neighborhood, complete with a signature bright yellow facade, a emerald green roof and guarded by two um, food dogs at the front of the entrance. And then in 2019, this building was covered, stripped on the outside of any characteristics or markers of Chinese-ness in favor of this white gray cube that you see on the right side here. Um, do you mind going to the next slide? And so this particular building right now, this is just a slide to show the building today with all the markers of hostile architecture that it uses from a boarded up um, front entrance so that folks can't sit on the steps there, as well as the use of flashing lights at night to deter, again, anyone from sort of sitting in this area. 
uh, to launch the to unveil this new space back in 2014, a four day art exhibition titled The Invitation was staged in late October. And it was branding itself as an international art exhibition that was really a real estate ad in disguise. So for many of us in this group, this was the cherry on top of the rapid gentrification that we saw occurring in the heart of our neighborhood. Uh, next slide, please. So, what we did in response was as part of a week-long initiative taking place in cities across Turtle Island called Chinatown's Coast to Coast um, fight against displacement. Organizers from FOCT as well as organizers from many different Chinatown groups um, did sort of actions in response to this reoccurring theme that Linda's described and that we're seeing happening across the board. And so organizers from FOCT created the anti Asian displacement garden. And what this um, sort of involved was first marching from the top of Spadina, uh, standing in front of this building of the former Bright Pearl, and then marching down to Chinatown Center. Next slide. Where we work to make a garden um, in Chinatown Center, which I think is, is has recently just been planted anew with beautiful new vegetables and beautiful new flowers. Um, we worked to sort of make this, this garden that was in the center that had sort of depreciated and uh, changed over time um, to what became sort of a pile of rubble. And so everybody sort of came together it, to make this, um, this place a, a stage, a place for community gathering and something that um, is kind of a space where folks can be without having to, to pay for things. There's, there's, um, there's really sort of less, uh, less and less public space for folks to just gather in Chinatown, for instance. Uh, next slide, please. And so what a lot of folks might know us from is in 2019, we were also notified about a proposed 13 story development change to 315325 Spadina, a space that currently houses businesses such as Roll Sam, Saigon Video, Jingang Pastries, as well as medical services such as Saigon Optical and Dr. Sophia Bao Hong. And you'll notice here on the left that this development sign is not translated in an area that has majority Chinese, Vietnamese, and um, English signage. Next slide, please. What we did in response to this was we made our own sign to notify the community of proposed changes happening in our neighborhood, which is the at the bare minimum so that community members can know what's going on and have a say in this proposal. We did the city and developers job, notifying residents, letting business owners know, as well as community members who rely on the neighborhood for the unique cultural and language services that it offers. Next slide, please. After navigating a confusing in initial community consultation meeting with the city and developer, um, where the in develop development meeting where the word Chinatown was not even used to describe the neighborhood, there was an outpour of concern and love from the neighborhood advocating for true constant labor processes that reflect the need of the neighborhood. Next slide. And so afterwards, development signs were translated in Chinese, both traditional and simplified, but not Vietnamese. And I mentioned this here, not as a, as a quote unquote victory, but um, because notifying the community of what's happening in their neighborhood is, is again, the bare minimum of what should be done. Um, but I mention this because this is a precedent in the city and um, at, a, at a platform such as this, um, so that communities can demand more from their representatives and changes happening in their neighborhood to, to sort of have a more responsive process for changes to be um, properly notified and addressed in accordance with the needs of the neighborhood. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and this is um, this is just a, a nice, really lovely shot of some flyering we did to sort of update the community about what's happening. Um, I'll mention this briefly a little bit more, but since we have undergone into the pandemic, we've um, you know started organizing more on Zoom. Next slide, please. And I'll kind of end talking about three one five Spadina by just saying that this development process has now been going on for two years, where we've can consistently advocated with the support of our friends, neighbors, and community members for affordable housing 
and retail spaces that serve the neighborhood. Uh, the motion for this building was just approved at the end of the month, and I won't get too much into that here, but SWAT will be releasing our reflections in a newsletter soon. Uh, next slide. Okay, um, I'll talk very briefly about some of the sort of organizing activities that we've been able to do um, uh, amidst the pandemic. So. What we've sort of done is, is something called digital direct actions, which are essentially Zoom rooms where we discuss, learn about subjects, and then organize via emails, phone calls, and collaboration with one another. And so some of the partners that we've worked with over the past year include Toronto Prisoners Rights Project, as well as Butterfly Asian and Migrant Sex Worker Support Network. And this is where I'll pass it off to um, Fox member Chi to talk about the rest of some of our activities. Thank you. My name is Chi, um, spelled C-H-I-Y-I. -I. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I have long hair that's kind of swept to one side and the third of my screen is taken up by foliage um, and I'm sort of dimly lit by a desk lamp uh, in front of me. So um, what to say from here? Next slide, please. We are now fully in exploration of strategies and other tools that are not reactionary on a development by development basis, but instead beginning to launch our long-term people's led planning for Chinatown. So we began our own research we could create more community control as an ecosystem in the neighborhood. Map how we can build community there is community power in Chinatown, but it's not equitably shared um, and has community care systems. Um, the realist kind of point of crisis that Here, what you see within the black border plans boundaries, you see green and purple, which are various kinds of heritage districts or secondary plans, which in other words, those are to some degree which is outlined in red um, by anything whatsoever in the planning system the only Chinatown and with the land it Um, and the idea with the community land trust is to take it off of the property market, the private which shows how that builds community power and control of Chinatown. And underneath all of this, which is really important to us, is the collective care. As opposed to
right on their own. They don't constitute all of community control. A broader vision and on the right. world we want to live in to you if you can find the of that poster um the community land trust is only you know there's so much that need to be enacted in order to protect tenants um to remain in a neighborhood Be trying to support our neighbors, please. Please, see street. Book, Building Saigon Refugee Urbanism in American Cities and Suburbs, is the first in depth examination of the visual and material culture of Vietnamese settlement. Her Shirk funded research, in partnership with the Chinatown West BIA, seeks to understand the legacy of racialized architecture. Name is in her room. 
and I'm wearing a beige roughly. Francisco's Chinatown in 1906 was financed by family associations and people with transnational business connections. Chinatowns are a mix of old and new, constructed by locally embedded as well as global capital, and has always been this. I'd like to follow of its the heritage of buildings, the stories they tell us about a community, is a palimpsest of different meanings created over time. For example, a Hong Kong developer built an Orientalist shopping plaza, China Court, on Spadina. It was a tourist attraction with its ponds, ornamental arches, and gardens, but it was also a source of pride for the community, serving as a photo backdrop for weddings, graduations, and clubs. When it was demolished and replaced in 1991 by the same developer, some community members feared the enclosed mall would draw businesses away from the commercial street. Instead, Chinatown Center has become a relatively empty and rundown shopping center, and its 214 residential condominium units are priced much lower than similar residents. Cafe Plaza is not built. In or other than a community. Young, Dundas, and Cobb.
the developing suggestion of it's with the call in business. The city planner also suggested lowering the ceiling height to dissuade larger chain stores and other members of the working group have continued to advocate for prioritizing culturally competent tenants. By the graduate students of, at U of T about the feasibility of Either identify it does not center our architecture. The working class newcomers and the elderly who rely on Chinatown's housing, shops, transit, and institutions more than perhaps anyone else. At the same time, the population of Chinatown is changing with growing numbers of 20 to 30 year olds compared with any other age group. And many of these young residents are low income renters. They're also in need of deeply affordable food and housing, yet they may also be the boba drinkers who do not require culturally competent businesses or informally loosely regulated spaces. And many are international students from China and Asia more generally. And the relationship to, to Chinatown is worth taking seriously when thinking about heritage within a context of ongoing diasporic movements. So what will the future of Chinatown heritage be? Let's take one more look at Chinatown Center, the giant white postmodernist mall built by a Hong Kong developer who filed for bankruptcy soon after its construction. The mall was envisioned as a modern outpost of Hong Kong. And this controversial statue of Sun Yat-sen was installed after a considerable amount of this controversy about whether Toronto's Chinatown should be involved in political disputes between Taiwan and the People's Republic of China. This plaza was soon abandoned to neglect, serving as a safe place for people to play games, sometimes for fun, sometimes profit. Over the past two years, T-Base, a community art space, transformed this basement level store and, as well as a neglected garden. The Chinatown Center Plaza was also temporarily occupied by artists during a 101 day action. They created game tables, made concrete casts of ubiquitous plastic stools. And elderly men who typically played in the sunken plaza were attracted to the event and they offered opinions about why it was better to play go downstairs away from the street. After the security guard finally chased the participants off the property, the tables and games were set up on the public sidewalk side next to street vendors selling toys and jewelry. The building and what it represented in 1991 has changed meaning over the past 30 years and yet what remains constant is a lively use and adaptation of public and private spaces through formal and informal means in large and small ways. As an example of Chinatown heritage, this mall is most likely here to stay, too big to tear down or redevelop for now. And until then, it will continue to play an important role in social, in the social, residential, and economic life of Chinatown. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica, for your insightful presentation. Up next, I would like to introduce Howard Tan. Howard is a strategic designer and urban planner. He is the founder of Think Fresh Group, a city building consultancy based in Toronto, responsible for such projects as Dragon Center Stories Commemoration Project and the upcoming Honest Ed's Alley Micro Retail Market. Um, Howard has worked with government and private sector clients in Canada to facilitate design strategies that create urban spaces with amazing human experiences. He has lectured about city building and the design and design at University of Toronto Rotman School of Management and the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Welcome, Howard. Thank you, Linda. Um, really great uh, to be here. Uh, so, um, hi, my name is Howard Tam. Uh, I am currently sitting in my living room wearing a pink t-shirt. Uh, I have short hair, I wear glasses, I have uh, beard, facial hair, mustache, <laughs> goatee, uh, and I'm currently sitting in a chair that I actually restored myself very recently, so I'm very proud of that. Um, and um, I, um, I I come to you today uh, wanting to talk a little bit more about um, the suburbs and the suburbs here in Toronto. So I'm just going to do a quick screen share. Just give me one sec here. Uh, okay, um, so here's the 
deck is now up. So yeah, we could talk a little bit about suburban Chinatown futures and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the project that I had the honor of coordinating for the last couple of years, which is Dragon Center Stories, uh, a project commemorating a suburban uh, Chinese shopping center. Um, like the most suburban thing you probably could commemorate in the world, a shopping center, an indoor mall. Um, and um, But it is a, a fascinating story and a very fascinating history uh, of kind of the, the movement of Chinese Canadian communities and Asian Canadian communities actually into the suburbs and actually what has actually happened since then and the developments that have actually occurred since then. So on the, on the screen right now, you'll see three different images of the Dragon Center Mall. Uh, the two on the right hand side are when the mall was first built back in 1984. And this is actually what the mall looks like today is on the left hand side. As you can see, the um, architecture has changed a little bit uh, over the years uh, where the wood paneling has been replaced with um, this large silver tower. Um, and um, uh, it, was, it was sort of modernized in the, uh, in the 90s uh, to get to this look. A really interesting uh, point to note about the Dragon Center is that it is actually the sister shopping mall of the Dragon City uh, down in Chinatown. It was actually built by the same developer. Uh, and actually, if you go into both, you know, the floor tiles are actually identical. <laughs> um, and um, so Dragon Center uh, was, but Dragon Center was built first. And so Dragon Center actually has the distinction of being known as North America's first indoor Chinese shopping mall. And it was built in the early, in the early mid 80s. Um, that's what it was, when it was developed and conceived and developed. It actually took over an old roller skating rink in Scarborough. Um, and uh, what happened was that it, um, uh, they transformed it into a series of tiny little shops. Um, and it was unique at the time in the sense that it was a very different kind of shopping mall than what most shopping mall uh, designers would have envisioned it to be. Um, and um, it, like it has, for example, um, which are more common now, but like these central units, for example, that uh, face inwards don't really have like any external windows, um, nor do they have any uh, internal service corridors. Um, so it is unique in that sense. And this is actually a, a kind of an architectural copy over from uh, many malls that were being built at the time in East Asia, uh, especially Hong Kong, uh, which is um, where the developer for this mall actually came from. Um, and what's really interesting too, is that uh, it doesn't actually have the typical sort of anchor shops that most North American malls would be known for at that time. So giant department stores or, um, you know, ma major sort of like uh, outlets, right? Um, that uh, would, have, would bring attractors in. Uh, it focused more on sort of this idea of like, Chinese uh, Canadian anchors. So that would be a large bank hall type restaurant, uh, supermarkets, um, hair salons. Uh, those are the things that, um, uh, that, that it was sort of built around. Um, and so it's, it's, it's unique in that sense. And um, what I think is really interesting most about this mall is how it has, it was actually the signifier of Chinese Canadian communities actually really starting to improve get into the suburbs, move into the suburbs. Um, and it actually was actually what kickstarted a lot of the um, uh, Asian sort of Canadian development projects, uh, shopping malls uh, from Pacific Mall to Market Village to uh, all sorts of the shopping centers up in Markham, <laughs> Richmond Hill, right? Uh, a lot of these things actually came after this mall. Uh, and a lot of the malls actually were influenced by the design of this mall and um, how this mall actually uh, sort of like the kind of the mix of shops and the mix of um, tenancies that uh, it, it it was um, it had pioneered. So just to give you a sense of where it is here in in Toronto. Uh, it's at the corner of Glen Watford Drive and Shepherd Avenue in Scarborough. Uh, its official address is 23 Glen Watford. Uh, so this is like right in the heart of suburbia. Um, and at the time um, uh, in 1984 when it was first built. Scarborough wasn't as diverse as it is today. Um, it was very much a, um, uh, a fairly like white suburban uh, community. Um, and uh, there were a few Chinese shops in the area. Uh, this area is known as Asian Court at the time. There was a few restaurants and a, a couple of grocery stores, but it wasn't uh, as uh, extensive as you would see it today. Uh, if you were to drive in this area uh, to the different strip plazas, you'll see a lot of different restaurants and a lot of different um, storefronts. 
Um, and so I'll get back to that point in a second, uh, like how, what that actually, what impact that actually had on the Scarborough community at the time. Now, what, what you're seeing here, of course, is a notice sign, the typical notice sign that means, uh oh, condo is coming. Uh, and um, that's actually what is happening. So I first noticed this actually in um, 2018. Um, as I, uh, so I, I live, I, I'm from Scarborough, I was born and raised in Scarborough, uh, and I'd gone to this mall as a kid a lot, and so it had a lot of, like, particular memories for me, and so I came back to Scarborough in 2018, and I started noticing the sign, and I was like, oh, there's a redevelopment project happening, what's going on, um, and so I, I actually sort of got into uh, trying to understand it a bit more. Uh, and what I did was um, I called the planner actually on this file and there's always a planner listed on these signs and you can just call them. And I, I actually studied urban planning. And so I, I, I wanted to actually ask about what is the heritage status of this site? Uh, and to my surprise, uh, you know, the uh, planner told me that no heritage report had ever been filed about this. They didn't consider it to be heritage. So which I actually sent him a few, uh, notices and I, like some stories about like how its status as the first Chinese Canadian shopping mall. And, and it was interesting because it really um, kind of, I think, enlightened the, the planning department a little bit because they were like, oh, this, this is interesting. Uh, maybe there is heritage here. And through some consultations and talking to uh, folks at Heritage Services downtown, they decided that maybe we should actually ask for a plaque. There actually is some, a story here that's far, beyond, that's far more interesting than what we initially thought. And so, just to tell you a bit about the story, so opened in 1984, of course, it repurposed an old older skating rink, as I mentioned, um, and large scale migration, it actually signaled a lot of large scale migration of Asian communities into the Toronto suburbs. Um, and this migration, of course, was not always welcomed. There was significant racial tension in the surrounding Asian court community in the early days of this mall. Um, the, despite this, though, the center did prosper and it's well remembered by an entire generation of Asian Canadians, uh, many of whom were actually uh, recent immigrants from uh, Hong Kong at the time in the 80s and the 90s, uh, coming over uh, for fear of um, the handover in 97. Um, and uh, a lot of these actually were wealthier, also Asian Canadians um, who, who came and uh, would shop at the mall and, and dine at the mall. And it was a site of like larger cultural gathering and practice uh, for many. Um, and as I mentioned, it's architecturally quite interesting. Now, just to give you a sense of kind of like what that uh, tension looked like when uh, Chinese people started showing up in a white suburb. Um, well, it, it kind of went both ways in the sense that like there was celebration of it in the sense of, oh, they're bringing new businesses here. This is kind of interesting. Um, but at the same time, there was people who were really upset. Part of the issue was that it was actually a huge planning error you know, on, the, on the part of the city of Scarborough at the time. They had not anticipated that like the only shopping mall in the first of its kind would literally attract everybody and their brother to show up at this mall. Uh, and parking just suddenly became, and traffic became a monstrous issue in this like previously quiet suburban community. And so a lot of people then of course blamed these Chinese businesses and said, it's all your fault. Why is Hong Kong here? We don't want this here. You should go home um, and, all, and all of that. And there was a point where hate literature was distributed. Um, and a lot of this actually led to a, um, a, a kind of a backlash against these Chinese projects that were in Scarborough, uh, which we would not even like, you know, th think too much about today. But uh, back then, like uh, there was, for example, the, the theater, which was, there was a proposal for Chinese theater, which ended up being sort of defeated because of these fears of like, uh, you know, t t Chinese people taking over and things like that. But at the same time, there was sort of this celebration of how Scarborough is now becoming this mecca for Chinese and uh, it's upscale and prosperous and, and things like that. So it, it was an interesting sort of narrative. Um, but like, just to remember that like, not, this was not always welcome. And so in 2019, we decided to approach the developer uh, of the project, who actually is the same developer who built the mall. And we wanted to remember this space because we felt it was a really good community space and something that we really should try to memorialize in some way. So we created this idea of a celebration, a commemoration event. Um, and what you'll see now here on this slide is some of the photos of the event itself. Uh, we had over 100 people actually show up uh, in the middle of October um, in 2019 to talk about a shopping mall, but also to share stories, really. That was really the point of this. And kind of, uh, which my Zim, of course, was a big part of, but um, part, a big part of this also was really just to talk about like, what does heritage kind of look like in the suburbs? Uh, because a lot, of, a lot of times, like these sort of shopping and commercial spaces, uh, they're not really considered heritage, uh, even though like lots of cultural activity is actually happening um, on the ground inside these spaces uh, uh, almost all the time. Um, and, and a lot of it is because also like people think of the sort of these spaces being very banal, the, the everyday, I just go shopping here, what's so, what's so important about it? But I think the fact that like 100 people showed up to want to talk 
memories of what this place was about uh, actually shows that there is massive heritage value in it and we should wait to talk about it. And, uh, and of course, this, this actually generated a lot of media interest. Uh, we got stories like in various different uh, media uh, outlets. Uh, my personal favorite one actually is the one on the far right, uh, Apple Dick and Hong actually. And they made a video and they were interested in this idea of like Hong Kong immigration and what that actually looks like. A bit about where this project is going now, because I'm notices here. Um, we're actually going to be this idea of like community perspective. People will actually use the mall, but we're, we're now also interested in looking at how, what the what different perspectives people have about this mall. And so, uh, had actually a bunch of students actually had come as part of their planning class to uh, sort of document what happened at the mall. And so there's and, and we're going to be putting up uh, shortly. Heritage and how that actually plays out in the suburbs uh, and what that actually means. Um, and and uh, we also have other people to participate in that. Uh, we have launched a new website uh, where all these stories are now. Uh, uh, you can visit dragoncenterstories.ca and you'll get, a, you'll get a sense of this. Um, and uh, the last piece I really wanted to talk about was actually like um, how this all sort of is like connecting together and here in the suburbs. And we often see these like strip plazas and these. Um, don't really look very exciting or interesting from an architectural perspective, but really there's a lot of happening here, right? And there's a lot of stuff that's actually being created inside of these spaces. Um, and uh, we buy them all the time. We don't really think too much about them, but it's really important that we actually find a way to capture the heritage that's actually really happening here um, and find a way to really talk about like kind of like the stories of uh, immigrant entrepreneurs, the stories of uh, communities coming together, the stories of community resistance, the stories of community survival, the stories of uh, transformation. Like uh, uh, screen right now, you'll see a picture of an Asian legend for Chalet. Uh, it's actually on Shepherd near Brimley. And it was actually transformed, right, from this, like the old architecture is still kind of on the outside of the building, but on the inside, it looks like a completely different thing. And that's a very common thing in Scarborough as well. Reappropriation of these like, like former used for completely different purpose um, and a completely different sort of cultural um, messaging actually being converted into um, uh, like newer businesses. And also a bit also a Scarborough, but thinking about also like Markham and Mississauga, Pacific Hall and the these are happening there with the you know the big gateway at Mississauga China which are very reminiscent of downtown Chinatowns uh, being constructed there uh, and also like what we've already lost things like market which was this really interesting uh, combination of, like Ontario small town architecture but housing a Chinese shopping mall um, in market so like I kind of want to ask like how do we tell the complex and diverse story of our suburbs in the future um, in Urban communities, commercial spaces double as community and cultural spaces. These include Chinese banquet halls, uh, Tim Hortons community centers, right, where uh, many seniors and uh, community members often gather over, you know, cheap coffee kind of thing. Um, and it's where culture is alive and being created. And there are many similar spaces in the GT groups whose function is very vernacular in its nature, but they can a lot to the community. Uh, these are spaces of belonging, heritage, identity, and we really shouldn't forget about them. And so, and sometimes it's really not just about the building, right? So our well, we're very clear, we're here to collect stories and we're really here to hear from the community about what space meant to them. Um, about saving the building at this point, um, just from an architectural perspective, it's not um, that interesting. And also the mall has run its course. It's no longer being frequented by anyone. Uh, it, like most there are not the original ones. So there's something, but there is something to be said about like, how do we actually capture the cultural, um, stories and nuances inside that and so question here which is that how might we actually create an intangible heritage program for toronto um and uh linda kind of touched upon this right the idea of like what is intangible heritage but i think because like in the summer right our building is 50 years old um and cultural her current heritage policy uh doesn't really capture the the heritage that's happening Inside of these spaces, and especially the diverse heritages that are now happening, because many uh, diverse communities are actually in the suburbs now, um, and they're living in the suburbs. And 
being their stories there. Um, so if we actually want to tell really interesting stories in the future about our communities here in Toronto, we have to find a way to capture this intangible heritage. Uh, that's actually really, really important. Um, and so what does, and so I, I, also we are losing some of this, right? Like we've already lost a, a fair amount of commercial heritage in the suburbs. And that actually is what most of the heritage here actually is. It's, it's a lot of these commercial stores because we don't have a lot of like major public spaces, but a lot of these commercial stores like those Tim Hortons com community centers or Dragon Center, right? Which are doubling as these spaces. And so we have to find, I think we have to find a way to, to capture this fully and be able to talk about it um, in, a, in a more meaningful way. Um, and what would this, what does this look like when community defines their heritage? And I'll, uh, I mean, I'll cite, uh, you know, Black Futures on Eglinton or the Tamil Archive Project or even Friends of Chinatown, right? Where communities are actually taking it upon themselves to be like, we're going to define actually what our heritage is. Um, and it is a lot about these sort of cultural stories that are happening inside of these, inside of these spaces. So could that be akin to something like the UNESCO framework? Controversial, I understand, but uh, also it could be something else entirely, right? But I do want to actually ask this question and think about like how we can actually do it because I don't really want like the story ultimately to be, especially in the suburbs of like, there's a kind, not really well acknowledged Aboriginal history of, the, of these spaces. Then there was like this like really well documented colonial history. And then it just became a suburb and nothing ever happened here again. And that's not true, right? And we know that that's not true. So we have to find a way really to, to, uh, to, to kind of talk, talk about that and document it. And just as a as kind of a next step also for, for the Dragon Center project, uh, we are also kind of as an invitation, what other Asian Canadian suburban spaces do we need to document? There are so many. Um, and so part of this is that we actually want to build a network and document the backgrounds and the stories of some of these places. We're definitely talking to the local communities about this and we're happy for our knowledge and learnings from the Dragon Center project. So please connect with us. Uh, our email is right there. Um, we would love to hear from you. Um, and so, yeah, so that's our contact information. Thank you very much. I uh, really do appreciate the opportunity to share and I probably am over time. So well, back to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Howard, for your expansive presentation um, and also provocative question, which is a good transition over to our roundtable.